All right, so everyone who is with us, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, welcome to the first of three seminars that are being hosted by the Archaeological Institute of America on the topic of critical conversations on race, teaching, and antiquity. So we have three seminars all together, and today we're going to be focusing in on decolonizing syllabi in the archaeology and history of the Mediterranean region. So that's our topic today for this panel. We have three different panels as the, as the three weeks move on. Um, we're going to generally be discussing techniques and strategies to promote new and diverse perspectives in classical um, pedagogy, whether that's archaeology, whether it's um, the whole sort of Mediterranean region. Um, we put together a great group of scholars here for this panel, as you can see. Um, they all, we all feel that we can enact real change in our classrooms and start that, um, start to make a difference really by introducing these subjects to our students with critical assessment of the past and a genuine dialogue about antiquity. We have a number of questions that we're going to be focusing on specifically. Um, I am Elizabeth Green. I'm a Roman archaeologist at the University of Western Ontario or Western University, uh, and that's in London, Ontario. I'm in Canada. I'm one of the co-chairs of the AIA's Diversity and Equity Committee, and that's who has put these together um, initially for the AIA. Um, and I'll be one of your moderators for today. So I'm going to start now, though, by passing it to my other moderator, my co-moderator, Vivian Laughlin. Um, she's going to introduce herself and uh, tell you a bit about the session and introduce the panelists. Greetings, everyone. I am Dr. Vivian Laughlin, a Fulbright postdoctoral researcher that's an, also an ancient Near Eastern and Roman archaeologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Just a couple of things before we get started. The chat has been disabled and replaced with the Q&A area. This, of course, is where any questions can be submitted. I'm monitoring this area, and if we cannot get to the questions today, we ask that you check on the AIA website in a few weeks, where we'll incorporate many of the Q&As from this webinar. Also, this session is being recorded and will also be on the AIA website. If we have any live tweeters amongst us, we ask that you please use the hashtag AIADEI. That's AIADEI. Um, our panelists are going to tell you a little bit about themselves, but first I'm going to introduce them. We have a wonderfully eclectic group of scholars on our platform, beginning with Dr. Katerine Bluet, Associate Professor on Roman History and Classics at the University of Toronto, Dr. Kathleen M. Cooney, Professor of Ancient Eastern Art and Architecture, Chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at the University of California, Los Angeles, Nahira Hill, PhD candidate in the Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology at the University of Michigan, Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy, Associate Professor of Classical Studies, Environmental Studies, and Women's and Gender Studies at Denison University, and Dr. Sorota Takash, Roman historian and the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at the College of Staten Island, the City University in New York. I'll pass to our first panelist, Dr. Catherine Bullen. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Beth and Vivian, for the uh, invitation. And it's truly really a pleasure to be here with everyone on the other side of your screens, wherever you are. Um, I thought I should uh, start uh, this uh, little three to five minutes intervention by um, reading a quote uh, which struck me as really um, powerful with regards to the discussion we are having today. So this is from Robin Wall, Kimmerer, Breeding uh, Sweetgrass. And it goes as follows. The story of our relationship to the earth is written more truthfully on the land than on the page. It lasts there. The land remembers what we said and what we did. Stories are among our most potent tools for restoring the land as well as our relationship to the land. We need to unearth the old stories that live in a place and begin to create new ones for we are story makers, not just storytellers. All stories are connected, new ones woven from the threads of the old. Um, so this, in my opinion, very powerful quote um, seems fitting for me um, for our discussion of today because right now in terms of my pedagogy, uh, what I am centering is um, 
the idea of voices and also the idea of stories. And really recently I've been benefiting a lot from learning and unlearning through um, the wisdom of indigenous elders and um, scholars um, who work here in North America on uh, what many nations call territorial island. And so uh, the way I envision my pedagogy is, is now rooted in this idea of the voices and of the stories. Um, and I am very grateful for, for this learning, which is still ongoing for me. And the question I want to ask all of you is, um, what stories are you making right now? What stories have our antiquity fields been making? And by doing so, which stories haven't we been making? Which voices have we shut down and why? And how can we do things differently? Um, to me, doing things differently means one, acknowledging the elephant in the room, which is the colonial white nature of antiquity fields. So archeology, span but other fields as well. And I use the term white in a wider sense that encompasses race, but also um, gender uh, and class and other elements as well. Um, and the other point starting from there is to try to disrupt that, to try to deconstruct this, this whiteness and to try to um, do things differently, little by little, each of us with the little power we have. And this all starts to me in the classroom. Um, the way I've come to, to, to look at my pedagogy and at my work this way is really intertwined with my own positionality. And I believe it's the same for everyone on this panel and for all of you who've registered. Um, I'm, um, I'm a first generation university student. Uh, I'm from Quebec. Um, so my family um, is a family of settler. We arrived in Quebec City in the mid 17th century. So we are from the very first wave of French migrants on this continent. And so we are settlers, but um, I also consider myself a colonial uh, subject of the British Empire. And so um, as such, and also as a female Roman historian, um, I, I very early on at this deep understanding that in order to even pretend to make it in the field, given my background and my circumstances, I had to go and get a colonial stamp of approval. In our case, for French Canadians, this uh, colonial metropolis is Paris and it's France, more generally speaking. So I did that. Uh, so I studied in France. I worked in French institutions as well uh, in Egypt. I studied there as well. Um, and so my own positionality and, and journey has allowed me to experience and also witness my and others colonial subjectivity. And now I've been in Toronto for 12 years. And I've started, especially with the conversation with uh, Usama Gad and uh, Rachel Mears, with whom uh, I created the blog Every Day Orientalism, to, 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 to move as I got more secure in my uh, professional career, as I got tenure, to move from a place where I want to prove that I can make it and I walk the walk and I talk the talk to feeling like it is my moral duty um, to, to speak up and to try to do things differently. So, so this is the place where I'm coming from to uh, chat with all of you today. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. So we're gonna move on to Kara Cooney. Oh, I remember to unmute myself. That's a good start. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I am a social historian specializing in ancient Egypt, and I am an educator of undergrads and grad students. I also have a reputation as a popularizer. <laughs> we can discuss that. I am sitting in my garage in Los Angeles on Tongva land. Those are the native people who are the custodians of this land. And so I've got all kinds of identities swirling around, right? Um, white female, grew up upper middle class in Houston, Texas, of all places, studying ancient Egypt, living in Los Angeles. It's complicated. But the, my perspective right now is that uh, we need to admit as Egyptologists that Egyptology, its foundations are inherently white, colonial, 
and racist. And I think the word needs to be used and we need to get used to saying it. And we need to get used to saying that we're all part of this um, racist system. And we need uh, calling out and cancel culture is something everyone's discussing these days. But I will call out something like um, Yale Egyptologists who dress up in pith helmets and jodhpurs and, um, and walk around Egypt as if that's not problematic. I will call that out. But I think that these call outs can also be problematic in, in many ways. Um, I will say that African American Egyptologists feel excluded from our field, don't even want to call themselves Egyptologists necessarily, but would feel more comfortable with being a Nubian specialists or specialists of Northeast Africa. And even the word Egypt is now tainted because the white supremacy of our field is so cleverly, skillfully, and subtly manipulated that people of color are, are pushed to the margins, uh, feel like they have to do Nubian studies, um, or feel like they need to move into a, an anthropology department or an African studies department. Um, so the word Egypt itself is charged. That's something that our field needs to reckon with. Uh, even the word Egyptology is problematic. It draws some very stark boundaries between uh, what one studies within ancient history. And the word Egypt is some weird, confusing conglomeration of, of Greek understanding of Hutkata, the temple of Ptah and Memphis, and that somehow gets moved into Egypt. And the Egyptians themselves would have called it Keme or Kemet, and this is what African, uh, people of African descent generally call Egypt. That's problematic too, because then it's only the Nile Valley. What about the people of the deserts, the oases, um, the people on the margins who are oppressed by the Egyptians at the center, people of the Southern Levant or Nubia. So do we call ourselves specialist of Northeast Africa? Maybe that's appropriate, but these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. Um, if we're going to make Egyptology more inclusive, I think we need to break down those boundaries between African studies and Egyptology. Um, we need to assume that we are not apolitical. How many times have you heard out, heard from, from scholars, people in academia, I'm not being political. It's apolitical. We're not discussing politics at all. Why are you inserting politics into this? Um, we are all um, of us, being political, I would, I would argue, and just by choosing certain texts in our syllabi and certain books, that is a political choice. I think the main problem here is that Egyptologists, white Egyptology assumes that it's telling an emic story, that it's speaking for the ancient Egyptians, a kind of we're speaking for our people, thus you can't tell us that we're not doing it right. And really, we have an etic perspective, and those things need to be... Um, broken down. Um, let's see. Okay, so if we assume that Egyptology itself is racist, but subtly so, with a white supremacy that is better trained, better educated to, to read this emic story, that people who are coming from the outside don't have the ancient Egyptian chops or the correct grammar or, or the way to approach it, then we need to create pipelines from the inside that enable people who feel excluded to be a part of this privileged circle. So in the same way that Catherine Blouin went to Paris, how are we going to include people on the fringes of our discipline to come to the center of Egyptology? And to do that, I'll just give you one little um, piece of the kinds of work that I'm doing to, to rectify some of these inequities. With my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Winterman, we've created a pipeline program with a historically black college fund here in the UC system, University of California system. We're working specifically with uh, Dr. Mario Beatty of Howard University, and we're going to have sent to us a number of undergraduates, probably four or five, uh, this coming summer COVID allowing, and those students will gain um, a, an expertise in partnership with Howard and with an African studies department on the one hand and an ancient Near East perspective on the other. And those students will work towards uh, language uh, ac accession and work towards the creation of a writing sample for application to graduate school. And so there will be a, a kind of training in an undergraduate um, 
space and at that level so that students can actually be a part of this um, Egyptology, which is so skillfully excluded to all but those who, who get to go to the um, Ivy Leagues or those East Coast universities. So one final point that, that I'll make, but, and then I'll kick it off, as I said, we should keep it short and here am I talking, um, and I apologize. But um, as we're trying to open things up and, and change our syllabi and include more voices, I think that it can be, in, it can be easy to include a number of white male voices and a number of black male voices, and then it becomes a patriarchal battle for the win. And I'm interested in transcending that in whatever way we possibly can. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. I have, I'm working through in my own classes some ideas for that, but I would like to move beyond an Egyptology fighting against an Afrocentrism. And because no one's gonna win that battle and it's all just a claim for primacy. And, and I would like to see some, some of that transcended. So now I will stop and move on to the next person. Sorry for going so long. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, that should give us a lot to talk about right there. <laughs> um, let's move on to Nadira Hill. Um, hi, I'm Nadira. Um, I am a graduate student, so I think um, like I'm, I'm very happy to have been included in this conversation, um, but just as a caveat, I don't um, have as much of the kind of, I think, freedom or flexibility, I guess, um, to to implement the kinds of change um, that we'll be talking about and that a lot of um, us have experience with um, on this panel. Um, but, uh, but I have um, been able to think creatively about how um, I, as a grad graduate student, can um, help to influence change and help to um, kind of bring some of these sorts of ideas to um, faculty members, um, particularly in my department, but also um, wider and wider, it seems. Um, so um, I've luckily been able to work with both graduate students um, and faculty members in several capacities over the past few months um, to this end. Uh, so first, um, I have been a member of the AIA Diversity Committee, um, a diversity and equity committee with Beth and Vivian um, and several other um, faculty members and um, uh, graduate students, um, which has been uh, really helpful to think about kind of the, the larger scale um, I guess, issues um, of, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, kind of in the field. Um, and second, I, I recently have been able to work with uh, both faculty members and graduate students in my own department um, at the University of Michigan, um, the classics department, um, in order to develop effective and accessible um, pedagogical approaches for teaching hybrid and remote courses in the fall. Um, this work was kind of more uh, geared towards, um, you know, making that transition from, from the, you know, in person to remote. Um, so it wasn't as much focused on, um, on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but um, I think all of this work that I've been doing um, kind of around that, um, including on the diversity committee, has made me think about the ways that we could, um, we could uh, change some of our courses and um, these sorts of, uh, you know, uh, issues that we're talking about here and in, in these, uh, the series of webinars, um, I think would have been useful um, or, you know, having a committee of some sort to uh, help people, uh, at least in my department, think about these different ways um, that we can make our, our classes more uh, inclusive um, would have been uh, a nice addition, but I mean, the work was, was very focused on the online um, element. Um, and then finally, kind of my my biggest, uh, I guess, work or contribution towards this um, this issue in our field um, has been my collaboration with a small group of graduate students from kind of across um, uh, like different institutions. So not just at my own um, at the University of Michigan, but with um, others. Um, I, I helped to. Uh, create and refine uh, the Black-centered resources for ancient Mediterranean studies document um, that you may have seen kind of floating around the internet and um, Twitter, especially um, a few months ago, and it's still accepting submissions. So if you have, um, uh, if you want to add things, you can, um, but the point of it was um, and still is uh, to spotlight the works um, of, of Black scholars in our field. Um, 
but also in adjacent fields um, like anthropological theory, black feminist theory, critical race theory, and more. So um, what this has kind of taught me and, and what, what I think uh, it made me realize um, rather um, is that, you know, it's one thing to, to be able to start from a document like this and pick out names or, or works that you can include in your syllabus. It's very easy to do that. Um, but we, I think we need to take that a step further and, you know, not just put a name on your syllabus and assign something, you know, by a black or indigenous or person of color um, scholar, but, but really, you know, uh, highlighting the work that they've done, um, you know, what their contribution has been to the field, um, talking about them, including, you know, images of them or videos of them speaking, I think would go a long way um, in, in uh, kind of decentering um, kind of you know the white voices that we're used we're used to uh, highlighting in our classes um you know talking about these scholars in in way in the way that we um at least in archaeology classes you know talk about like schliemann and and um arthur evans like you know uh bringing bringing those voices into the conversation and also getting our, our students to think critically about them um i think would be a great help um particularly like from my positionality like i'm um, you know, a, a black student, a black graduate student, um, and I, I think it it would have been nice to be able to see um, those sorts of contributions from you know black scholars um, that I I honestly didn't even know um, that there were so many uh, works that people were um, contributing to the field until we created this this document. Um, so I think. It's, it's not enough to just have a, a name um, or include these works um, on your syllabus, but you have to, you know, actually represent them. You have to get your students to, to see that it's not just these, um, this traditional kind of framework. It's, uh, you know, not just white male voices that are, are contributing to our field, but there are also these, um, these less recognized voices. Um, and, you know, also bringing in um, uh, not just the scholars that are working on on ancient Mediterranean studies, but also scholars that are working on, um, you know, critical race theory, black feminist theory, because there are, um, I think, a lot of things that that they have in common um, with our field, but I but we are often hesitant to bring them in because we feel we we can't make those connections. But I think um, it would be helpful for especially for students that have less of a connection with um, with classics, you know, with less of a, a background with it to bring in some of those kind of more more modern um, parallels to kind of ground themselves in um, in what they're learning. So um, that is that is my interest in, in this. Great. Thank you so much, Nadira. Um, Rebecca, please. Um, hi. OK, so I'm going to start with two things. One, the reason why I'm last is because just in case people don't know, Futo is my middle name, not my last name. Um, I sometimes see myself hyphenated uh, in places and I just want everyone to, is who is here, I can have like a blanket statement. It's Kennedy is my last name. Um, but uh, the second thing is um, I'm coming at this today from a slightly different perspective than many of the um, other panelists as well because um, I am not an archaeologist. Um, I have gone on to dig sites. I've done the American School. Um, I am trained in epigraphy, um, but I'm primarily a Greek historian, and um, but I'm also a fully trained philologist. <laughs> so, um, so, so I sort of, uh, I sort of um, straddled the worlds in a way that is a little bit different than the way that other uh, people in this group do. Um, I also teach at a small liberal arts college, which doesn't have any graduate students. Um, and uh, we have three faculty tenure lines, and then we have two um, spousal positions. So I don't work in a I don't work in, a, in conditions where there are graduate students. I don't work in conditions where there are really large numbers of contingent faculty um, or other um, types of issues. And um, so, so I come at my pedagogy from a very different perspective, and my concerns about the pipeline of the field from a very different perspective. Um, in part because I'm not training graduate students. And in fact, um, one of the big gaps that, that I will talk, I can talk about um, and see is that what has happening at small departments across the country and as we move to change our courses and our programs to actually um, be more inclusive of the study of antiquity, um, which is my primary goal. Um, I specialize in um, issues of race, ethnicity, gender and immigration. Um, in the ancient world, um, less so in the modern world. I do modern reception as well. 
Um, but as we diversify our courses and we change the focuses of our curricula away from language specific departments to sort of broader um, curricula to incorporate more history, more archaeology and art history, et cetera, um, what that means is that our students become um, untenable for graduate programs. They can't get accepted to graduate programs. And so it's a trade off that we have to make where we have to decide, are we training people to enter into the graduate structure and into the hierarchy of the field? Or are we training people to actually understand the ancient world in a more comprehensive way? And then that's our actual goal <laughs> and not to create a pipeline or to change the field uh, as a profession, but to change the way that people who come through our courses understand the nature of the ancient world and also to come to understand what it might mean to call something classics. Um, I don't come from a background that is a prestige background. I don't sort of understand the East Coast IV networks. I don't understand the European networks. I was a state school kid, a first-gen college student. I don't teach at a university where classics has ever been a prestige discipline. Um, most of the students who enter into my classrooms will never take another classics course, have never even heard what classics is. They took the class because they saw a description and they saw Greece, Rome, Mediterranean, maybe they saw Persia, maybe they saw, you know, something that, that appealed to them or their friend told them to take the class. Um, maybe they took high school Latin. Um, but that's it. They don't even know what we are uh, frequently. So um, the, when I talk about my classes and sort of the approach that I take to my classes is really about thinking about how does the world understand what we, it is that we study? Why does it matter what and how we study? And, um, and who am I trying to impact? Who's my audience? And my audience isn't the profession and my audience isn't um, creating mini me's. Um, my audience is changing the perceptives of people who will never probably take another classics course in the world, but might read an article in the Atlantic, or they might read something on the Washington Post, or they might attend an AIA public lecture um, or something. And how do they understand what we do and how do they understand the ancient world? Um, that's my target audience um, for the most part. So um, that's just a little bit about um, sort of my positionality, as it were. Um, it's, very, it's a very different positionality than many people take in these conversations. Um, also, I work in a place where I can basically teach any class that I want. So if I want to teach a class on the art and architecture of white supremacism and how classic, that classical architecture is used for that, I can do that. I've done that twice now. Um, I can teach my courses on race and ethnicity in the ancient world. Um, and I can have them run through an environmental studies program by focusing on environmental determinism. I've done that for years. Um, I can also focus my energies on blackness, um, how, how classics is used in the creation of black um, identities and white identities in America. I, I've done that as well. Um, I can bring anthropological critical race theories, um, black feminism into my classrooms um, whenever I choose to, um, because I don't have people I don't, I'm not in a large department where people are going to tell me what to do. <laughs> so so um, there's a lot of freedom that I have to do what I do, but also I have very little power to actually change the face of the discipline, as it were, because I'm not part of a, the hierarchies and the part of um, training the future of the, the, the discipline and the professionals. So that's sort of um, where I'm coming at this. So I, my whole conversation will be very much about the pedagogy um, uh, of what we can do. Um, and less focus on graduate, um, the pedagogy at the undergraduate level and less focused on sort of graduate work, just so we're aware. All right, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, Rebecca, really helpful. Um, and perfect timing, Seralta, alphabetically, here you come uh, for your quick three to five minute uh, introduction. I am Seralta Trakat. I'm a Roman and Byzantine historian and uh, I'm, you know, realize that I belong to the older generation now. It's interesting. I'm also Dean of Social Sciences and the Humanities, which includes the Performing and Creative Arts at the CUNY uh, College of Staten Island. And um, um, all my work has always been kind of against the grain. And uh, in a way, uh, I see myself um, very much as a, as a feminist, uh, kind of fighting the patriarchy in a way. And I've always tried to uh, include in my syllabi new things, new ideas, uh, new approaches. And I have found myself often uh, at odds with, with some colleagues, not just in departments, but also at large. And so um, while I was uh, you know, writing, doing research uh, in Roman religion, which is my specialty, um, and I was always interested in the peripheries. So that's the work I, I did 
I think because I felt uh, always since childhood as someone who was never in nor out uh, because of, of my heritage. Uh, my dad was a refugee from Hungary and while I was uh, became a Swiss citizen eventually, um, I was never part uh, of, of Swiss society because of my name. It's a totally Hungarian name, although I had a, a Swiss mom. And coming to the United States actually for me was extremely freeing, but uh, finding it uh, on the surface so open, but then as you dig down, it becomes really uh, stratified, classified, you know, ca almost caste systems and, and so forth. And then the, the racial component, uh, which for me has always been, um, you know, again, difficult. It's always, always thought in terms of enlightenment, it shouldn't be there, but it's there uh, so strongly. And even what I think more difficult, subtly and, and often invisible and yet so powerful. So, um, so my work has always tried to, to look at, at what is accepted and yet should be changed. What is the norm yet is a normal and, and so forth in terms of just uh, you know, humanities. So I always felt maybe I could bring change about as being an administrator for which I somehow seem to have had a knack. So uh, while I never was a chair, uh, I did everything and a lot of it ultimately uh, I became, uh, you know, a, a dean in residence and, and kind of saw how when folks just decide on things and then we have to implement it on the students, that can be extremely uh, <laughs> something totally different that you ever imagined. And ultimately I became an academic dean and trying to figure out with my faculty how we can be creative, how we can be cutting edge, how we can think about to shape the future uh, of this country uh, in terms of uh, the intellectual paths people uh, you know, we have, ought to take, should take, and, and so forth, but also counted as an administrator at the decanal level that I'm sometimes running against a faculty who's interested, not interested, couldn't care less, uh, and not being engaged. And uh, ultimately also, uh, my colleague just mentioned hierarchy, yes. The newest members of a, of a team are the ones with those great ideas. And yet the ones who have been there forever are, are the ones who have seemingly the power. And so it, it becomes a power struggle, which you try to mediate, mitigate, ameliorate, uh, and yet trying to, to move forward. And it becomes, you know, so glacial. And, and then it's, it's just, you know, while you are on top of it, all of a sudden you're so behind. And, uh, and so, so it's, it's always this, this kind of dance we all play to a music sometimes we don't even know what it is. And uh, so I hope my contribution will be that I can help all of you so interested in decolonizing syllabi, which is so, so important uh, to, to kind of give you the administrative side and maybe some, some ideas how to work with folks like me. Um, so that's my intro. Thanks so much, Geralta. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to run this um, like a conversation based around questions. So we have some set questions that we've come up with essentially by way of what people are talking about in the field and sort of, you know, the, the things that are on the top of people's minds right now. So we kind of created a set of questions around that. Um, I want to point out as well to the audience that the Q&A is active um, and we'd like that for you guys to use that for questions for the panel. So we're going to do this for the next 45 minutes or so and then spend the rest of the session, the end of the session, dealing with questions that are coming in from the audience. So please use the Q&A for questions. Um, if you can avoid using it just for sort of chat here and there, just so we can kind of really keep on top of the questions that people want answered, we'd like that. Um, so this is where you get your pencils and papers ready. Uh, we are going to approach this. Um, we're going to start with an easy question, not really, um, which is, um, we, we put these together, you know, what people have been thinking about, like I said, and one of those things is the, is thinking about the term decolonizing. And we've got a couple of people here um, in Canada and a couple, and then the rest of people from America, but from, you know, different, all sorts of different backgrounds, as you've heard, and the term decolonizing can really mean different things in different places. And so one of our questions where we want to start is, should we be using the term decolonizing? We hear it so often in terms of decolonizing syllabi, 
Um, and what implications does the term have for you all in the classroom or how does it sort of affect the way you um, approach teaching? And I'd like to think Colin Katerine to start this one because I know that this is one of the conversations we've been having and then anybody else just jump in and um, I'll be keeping an eye on who's got their hand up. So I, I will just start with a, a, a short anecdote. I was invited to give a, a talk at the last Classical Association of Canada's uh, conference, which was postponed to next year. Uh, but in the winter before the pandemic, uh, I went to meet with um, Lee Miracle, who is a wonderful uh, writer and artist, and who's an elder also here at the University of Toronto. And uh, I had been asked to talk on a panel about decolonizing classics in Canada. And I am very much aware that this use of the term is seen as something very problematic by a lot of indigenous uh, people. And so I, I went to meet with her and I told her about the title of the panel and then she was like, but what does it mean? What does decolonizing mean? I said, well, it means to give back the land to the indigenous people who are the custodian of that land. And she said, yes. So that question does not make any sense. And then the advice, and I hope I'm rendering it well, but the advice she gave me is, you cannot talk about this, this is nonsensical. What you can talk about as a settler is how, how can I be a classicist, a settler classicist in this settler colony? on Turtle Island, so, and, and what can I do about that? Um, and and um, if, if you guys are interested to think more about this concept, there's a now seminal article called Decolonization is not a metaphor. Uh, it's from 2012, it's by Yves Tuck and uh, Wen Yang. I highly recommend it, it's um, free access online. Uh, so, so out of respect in this particular context we're in in North America for, for indigenous uh, nations, I think the term is not, is not appropriate. I don't have another term. I know it's very useful. However, if we think about decolonizing archeology span in the field with regards to the places where we dig, in my case, Egypt, or in Karen's case, Egypt, then perhaps we can have another conversation about what it means to decolonize archaeology in Egypt from an Egyptian perspective. But as far as North Americans are concerned, I, I have a little discomfort with using it. Can I jump in really fast um, since there, you said yeah. Egypt so, <laughs> so well? For Egypt, it, for Egyptology, it works um, when you're talking about Egyptians but for, for an Egyptology, we're really facing a two-pronged battle, right? One with the African-American exclusion within North America, and then the other, the exclusion of the Egyptian scholar within the world um, academia of Egyptology. And for Egyptian scholars who have to get the PhD outside of Egypt to be considered within Egypt as a real player in the field, you can't get more colonial than that. So it, for us, it works. Um, and you, that's one of my best pipelines is AUC, you know, American, Univ American University in Cairo is one of the best pipelines for from a master's program into American PhD programs. That's quite telling as well. And that the University of Cairo system, as many of my Egyptian colleagues know, can take forever, is underfunded, is highly problematic to get through. So um, how do you include Egyptian voices when the playing field is so unlevel? So just to add there. Great. Does anybody else want to add in on that? Rebecca. Sorry, my, my, I have two monitors going. So unmuting takes me a while to get the mouse dragged back over. Um, so I would just say on the issue of decolonizing, um, I've had this conversation with a number of my colleagues. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as decolonizing your syllabus. I, I really think that this idea that we can somehow um, take our syllabus, a syllabus itself is de facto a colonial artifact, and there is no way to take your syllabus uh, working in a university um, and working in a discipline 
that can actually change that classroom. And you cannot decolonize your mind. Uh, I know people have seen this as well. I think that we can simply try to do the best we can to be critical about our past. There is a feminist term for this, which is revisionism, um, where you sort of go back and you do a critical um, engagement with past scholarship, with past um, methods and modes. I think it's the best we can do. Um, to actually do this. I, until June of this year, um, since 2014, I directed the university's museum. I can decolonize my museum. And what that means is I can repatriate everything that's in my museum, right? So there are actual, if you're, unless you're going to do something that is actually materially going to impact and, and, and return and um, deconstruct and unbind the um, sort of settler colonial over overarching structures, I don't think that we can really talk about what we're doing as decolonizing. Um, and so I don't ever talk about it in that way, um, unless I am, again, referring to the same article that Katrina has already referred to, the decolonization is not a metaphor article. Um, I just don't think it's possible. And to bring in something like genetics here, um, because this is actually something that I think a lot of archaeologists need to think very seriously about. Um, I worked with colleagues in anthropology, biology, and history um, last semester, last year until COVID destroyed it, to run a race and genetics workshop, a, a, a year-long seminar on campus with speakers, et cetera, and um, you know, not taking indigenous views into account. You're not going to decolonize your field through ancient DNA. Um, so these are all things I just really think we need to think about with these terms. What do we mean by them? Let's not take terms that have real, real can have real impactful meanings and turn them into something that is um, milk toast and, and, and really just a, a misappropriation of those terms. Thanks. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, maybe the next seminar will be what should we call it when we, um, you know, approach these sorts of things, but it's a, it's a really important thing to think about. Does anybody else want to add into that one? One thing I'd like to um, point out as well, we've already mentioned a couple of different resources and a couple of, uh, you know, different citations, and we will put together after this session, we'll put together a list of everything and make sure that that gets to everybody, um, whether it's on the AIA website, but we'll let you know where you can find all of these things. Um, I think that's a perfect way to go into our second question, in fact. So if we are not going to think about it as decolonizing, which we all, I think, recognize has some of it, has many of its own problems associated. Um, in a field like classical archaeology, there's also a good deal of complicity in the past practices um, that you mentioned, Rebecca, just now, um, and origins of the field. And so I'm wondering, how do you bring the role of disciplinary history and complicity in past and existing power structures and practice in our field into your teaching in the ancient Mediterranean? Can you bring that into the classroom and sort of have that as a starting point? Um, and I know some of you I know are biting at the, I'll just stop asking the question. Um, who wants to go first on this one? Rebecca, do you want to take this? You have the biggest smile on your face. Oh, oh sure. I mean, I just spoke, but I'll go ahead um, because I do this already. Um, this is one of the fun things that I do. Um, uh, so in terms of bringing this stuff into the classroom, um, one, I'm just very explicit about it. The first week of my class is deconstructing the concept of civilization. Thank you, Katerine, for your wonderful uh, Everyday uh, Orientalism article. Um, I deconstruct the concept of Western <laughs> civilization and the West. Um, I, I sort of make a very strong point of sort of moving through and uh, defining our terminology. We go through and we talk about what, what do we mean by the term race when we're talking about the ancient world? What do we mean by the terms ethnicity? Um, how do we uh, construct narratives? What is a narrative? Um, and how has, uh, and we start from the reception of these ideas and we move backwards um, back into the ancient world. I do this in my Greek and Roman history courses. I do this in my specialty race and ethnicity courses. Um, I interweave throughout the entire um, course of the semester. Um, I uh, interweave um, works that are receptions, um, popular media articles, um, moving back and forth. The students actually like seeing how to make these connections between what they're reading about the ancient world um, and also what they are, um, and what they are uh, uh, seeing in the media. Um, which I think is really important, whether it's playing video games, um, uh, getting caught up into an algorithm in YouTube that takes them into um, the deep, dark spaces, um, whether they're on Reddit. Um, always thinking about how can we engage them at that level and then show them the roots of these, the problematics of those concepts that they're wielding. Um, 
I take that more of a tack than I know some of my colleagues will do things like tackle things like the Black Athena debates. That's a little esoteric um, in terms of for most of my students, they're like, oh, great, a bunch of scholars arguing with each other. Um, they would prefer to actually um, know why they shouldn't think the 300 is the greatest movie ever made, um, even if the soundtrack is good, right? So it's actually quite easy for us if we pay attention to what is what our students are actually engaging and seeing and talking about um, to to take those things and help them learn how to assess them and to help them learn how to um, deconstruct them. This semester in a new course that I'm teaching, I'm actually structuring their papers around controversy, public controversies over antiquity. So we're engaging with ancient aliens. We're engaging with whether the ancient world is white. Um, we're engaging with um, how Rome fell. Um, and, you know, sort of looking at these things where if they went onto a, a forum like Reddit or if they put into, which I see on my blog regularly, where are the Greeks white? Like what websites are they getting drawn into? And they have to go find those places. And then we have, we're gonna do an exercise where we assess them um, in the class context. And then I have to give them the tools to do that. And that means engaging in the scholarship of, of critical white studies um, and of, 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 of other types of studies to get them to think about what is white supremacism. It's not the KKK and Charlottesville. It's the structures that we exist within. And how do we give them the tools that they need to deconstruct that? It's actually, I, I would argue that it is in fact very quite, quite easy to find ways to integrate these things into our classes if we are willing to, and I know Katrine does some exceptional work on this, um, if we're willing to go where the students are and not um, keep ourselves locked up in our scholarly cages. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, does anybody want to react to that? Yeah, I, I would like to uh, you know, say that, yes, indeed, I think to, to find the, the students, let's call it at their level, I'm putting quotation marks, how they engage with, excuse me, do you hear me now? <clears throat> engage with, with you know, th their computers, their searches, their, their Twitters. Their I'm Twitter. sorry, Sarolt, I need to interject. Hear you. We cannot hear you very well. Can you okay. do a mic I'll check? Yeah, let's do a mic check. I, okay. Can you possibly hold your mic up closer to your mouth? Let's see. Let me do Better this way? It's much better that way. All righty. This is Thank probably you. a bad headset. So I, I was just uh, saying to, uh, to what I'm um, kind of commenting on Rebecca, I think it's, it's a, the best way of, of going about teaching our subject matters uh, that have so many constructs built in. We actually have a core course, so this is where I think, you know, we can, you know, as we work together as faculty to engage students and find ways of teaching them how to use the internet. What happens when you start, you know, searching? Where do you end up? And the analysis that goes with it. So if we can get more points of connections between courses, that would really be, you know, the, the kind of the best way of getting our students to become, uh, you know, analytical thinkers, which is so important in the Bloom taxonomy, and uh, we all want, and yet we, everything seems so fragmented. So they do it in Becca's course, then they may have done it in my course, and it never gets connected. So, you know, as administrators or as chairs or as faculty, to push for those those connections, that it's their re reiterations. And uh, I think this is very, very important uh, as we look at these constructs and deconstruct them to try to, to find, you know, better ways and, and, and getting the educated new generation. Kara, can I? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think learning how to read and teaching a student how to read is, is um, not easy. And I'll, let me put it this way. When you juxtapose white scholarship and scholarship that is coming in from the outside, the white scholarship can be apolemical. It can be non-angry. It, it has the privilege to be so. And then you read scholarship of color or Egyptian scholarship in my case, and you feel more polemics. You read it, it feels angry. It's kind of like watching the protests out on the street in the United States and the white privileged people are like, why are they looting and burning? They're so angry and destructive. But if you have the privilege to not have to do that, then you don't have to do that. So you have to teach how to read politically and how to disentangle what privilege is even within scholarship so that a white 
Egyptologists can present a particularist approach that is as political as anything else, but is so subtly conveyed as to be apolitical. And this is why within my classes, I avoid particularism like the plague. And how much, how much have we been trained in particularism? This is our bread and butter. This is what we do. If you don't have the right footnote and, and cite the right scholar and include the right date and have all of the right stuff, then you're a bad scholar. How can you be universalist and compare ancient Egyptians with the modern day? How dare you? That takes away the ancient Egyptian context. But that particularism is part of white power and privilege or whoever's on top, right? It's part of the, the racist agenda to keep these ancient peoples in their exotic spaces, something that we can look at from afar and we can say, oh, they're like a different animal almost, a different, a different race or a different subspecies or something and we can particularize their kingship and say, oh, look at how they do that. We would never. Well, <laughs> the 2020 has allowed so much of this exceptionalism to blow up in, in, our, in our faces, right? So now the particularism is being swept aside and we can compare ancient Egyptian kingship with America's Trumpism and go, oh my goodness, look at this is authoritarianism. Here's A, B, C, this is how they're doing it. You can compare something that seems so foreign and different that is of the ancient world with something that is happening around you today. And the it's, it's like the simple things of breaking down those tools of entitlement and privilege that we're doing all around us from shopping and without a mask or with a mask to how you write about a farming technique in ancient Egypt. It's all embedded. And if you teach the student how to read for power, then you can, you can get somewhere. And I can't exactly, if you guys can follow up with how, you know, details of how one can do that, but this is what I, what I try to do. Kara, can you quickly, we've had a, qu a couple of questions come in, just what you mean when you use the term particularism. Can you just um, explain in a nutshell? Yeah, that you're, you're focusing, well, you're not allowed to compare that. Okay, so I'll make it a little personal. So one of the worst book reviews I ever got was in the Times Literary Supplement written by Christina Riggs, an Egyptologist. It was about my book, 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 the book, The Woman Who Would Be King. And I compare her ruling strategy in a feminist manner to female ruling strategies today and how, you know, I compared ancient Egypt to the modern day. And I was accused of being universalist. And so, the, and this is coming from a scholar who is saying, no, no, you cannot do this. Ancient Egypt deserves and must be put into its context. Everything must be contextualized. It must be separated. And you have to, to study it in, in and of itself and not include the entire human species or any sort of comparisons because they're fast and loose. They're irresponsible. They lack rigor. And when you do that, in my opinion, and you know, these, these book reviews, they hit hard. You're like, oh my God, look at I'm universalist now. What does that mean? And the more I've thought about it, the more I realize that that is another, that is white power, putting Egypt into a box and saying we cannot compare it, or Greece, or Rome. Can you compare Greece to Rome? Can you compare, compare Greece to us? And if you are not allowed to do that, that is particularism. That is this anthropological idea that everything has to be studied in a thick description with, with all of its details. And then if you don't study in that way, you can't fully understand it. And who are we to really know? And this is part of that that white supremacy of we do the emic better. And you coming from the outside with your African-American Afrocentrist perspective, you're not doing it right. You're bringing your politics in. We are apolitical. But what I'm trying to say is particularism is as much a veil uh, for power as, as anything else, but it is much harder to see, to pinpoint, to put your finger on. Does that kind of explain? Yeah, thank you. I think that's good. Thank you. Um, Katerine, you also have a look on your face, like, let's jump in here. <laughs> I, very, I very much like what everyone is saying. I think what Kara just said really brings us back to, you know, the crux of the matter, which is what we're working on, academia itself, if we really want to be existential with this Pandora's box, is a byproduct of colonialism that serves it, right? So all these little boxes, all colonial boxes. So I've come to a point where I'm thinking, how can you not talk about this when you teach? How can you not talk about it? It's everywhere. So as Kara said, if you don't talk about it, you're kind of, you're kind of comfortable in your privilege. You have the privilege of not being able to see it or you've, 
you've just not been conditioned to see it. But my way of approaching it obviously depends on the on the classroom. So at the undergraduate level, I teach in Scarborough, which is the eastern part of Toronto. And I would challenge everyone to show me more diverse classrooms than my classrooms, which I adore. Uh, it's, it's a great learning environment. And I have to bring in all these students into the conversation. And downtown in the grant department, it's a very traditional uh, classics department in terms of the student population, still overwhelmingly white and white passing. And so according to the, the, the level of the class and the, the environment, I will adapt my, my teaching strategy. Um, but what I like to do is try to just explode. You need to explode the canon. You need right away to put students out of their comfort zone, put yourself out of, the, um, out of your own comfort zone and uh, shape the, the building a little bit. So it can be anything from, you know, in an introductory class on the ancient Mediterranean, having a small segment where you show archival videos of 19th century excavations in Egypt to the talking about the Bamiyan Buddha or talking about this controversy over Alexander being Greek or Macedonian. In Scarborough, it always means that I'll have students who will come who are of Macedonian and Greek background and will like talk to me about their take on it. But that's a way to, to bring them in, right? And it can be downtown in the grad department. I'm lucky enough that I have a certain level of freedom. So I've been proposing and teaching grad seminars on Orientalism and the classics. Now I'm teaching indigeneity and the classics in the fall. And for our ancient history methods class, which also includes uh, several students who are in the archaeology stream, I've successfully proposed now for two years a module on, um, how was the name? Colonialism and the ethics of uh, artifacts. Where straight away, the students for three sessions, we explored the, the history of the field, the ethical entanglement. And so there are so many case studies, right? Starting with this new book on the Jesus wife fragment, for instance, like this is, this is gold. This is gold at the undergraduate level. This is gold at the graduate level. So the way I see it, from the moment you're tuned to that, you, you can in many ways just put it in. And, and there is an interest for it, for sure. So I'll stop it, I'll stop it here. Yeah, it's great to hear that also, I know the next two seminars in this series will be talking about how do you incorporate kind of current events to use an old fashioned term, but you know, how do you bring that into and, and what everyone's saying, I think really does bring that into the classroom, you know, using the things that are happening in our, in our world because they're not disassociated with what we're talking about, right? There's people are still um, looking you know, very seriously at, at this material. Um, and that actually does, Katrine, what you, I'm gonna move us on to the next question, just in the interest of time, what you just said brings us perfectly to the next question, which is, um, you know, thinking about, um, about our, our, uh, our classroom strategies. So what has been um, most successful? Yeah, sorry, I just got confused with my questions. Um, most successful to bring these new perspectives, to bring new authors, to bring new voices into particularly the introductory level classes or classes that already exist within the repertoire of the department. Because I think what a lot of us face is that we can't sometimes, um, I'm also lucky that I get to teach kind of whatever I want basically, um, but that a lot of people don't have that luxury. You've got to fit this into, you know, Greek Civ or Roman Civ 101 and figure out how to bring these ideas in, right? Um, so how do, what kind of strategies do people use um, in that sense? Bring it into old classes that we all know and love into those intro classes um, within the repertoire that's already existing. Rebecca, uh, Nadira, do you want to start? Let's go with Nadira. Um, so, I mean, like I said before, I'm not, I don't get to create my own courses, but I think um, <laughs> something that um, I think would be relatively simple to do, and I mean, I'm sure maybe Rebecca could speak to this more because um, you mentioned that you also do um, uh, work with modern um, uh, scholarship. Um, and so I think, you know, just if you already have your, your, your course kind of laid out, you could bring in some of these, um, you know, uh, different perspectives. So, um, you know, there are potentially people 
um, you know, people of color, black scholars, indigenous scholars that are talking about the same things or similar things um, from a different perspective um, to things that you already have on your syllabus. So like you could easily just add that in and like do um, a discussion that's um, kind of, yeah, um, allowing students to, to think critically about the different perspectives that are being represented. Um, and I, I also, I mean, I didn't get to say this before, but I think that um, something that I thought was really interesting from the previous discussion was, um, you know, uh, the, it was mentioned like meeting students where they're at and using like what they're already um, familiar with from like popular media and, um, and also this, this idea of particularism and, um, you know, not being afraid to make those sorts of, uh, you know, parallels between the ancient world and um, the modern world. I think an interesting way of doing that too is like if you if you can't think or if you don't want to think um, for whatever reason of these modern parallels you could ask your students to bring them um, uh, to you know whatever they're learning about like you know you, they've probably seen something about white supremacy they've probably seen classics being used um, or the ancient Mediterranean um, more broadly being used in in some dubious way and they could bring that to the class um, and you could discuss that um, you just have to I guess build it in um, to, to your larger course, but I think that would also be um, potentially something um, easy to do, just asking your students um, to, to come with their own experiences of um, whatever it is that you're talking about, whether it's the, the class itself or, or you know, a, a, a smaller unit of it. Um, I think that would be um, potentially effective. Thanks, Nadira. Uh, Rebecca? So um, I'll take, I, I wanna, I'll, I'll, I wanna talk about two specific classes because I, I, um, I teach all intro, a lot of intro level. Um, so for example, um, I teach a uh, intro to Greek history, intro to Roman history, which are a sort of traditional structures. Um, and then this year I took over teaching a uh, intro 101 course that is just for first year and second year students that um, it used to be called classical cultures and was supposed to be a sort of survey of Greece and Rome, sort of the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome is sort of how my colleagues have taught it. Um, and I reinvented it as an intro to the Mediterranean, the ancient Mediterranean uh, course. Um, and so I, I think just thinking about if you're like, so for that course, I got to sort of reinvent it however I wanted, because I'm the only historian in the department. And so they always expect that when I take a course that's on the books, it's going to become a history class and not a literature survey. Um, so there is that sort of benefit, but we've also been in a situation where they realize that since I took over those classes, they just made their own lit survey lines so I can do the history ones. But this idea that we are somehow constrained um, and we have, yes, we have to teach a course that is Greek history, but does that Greek history course have to start with, you know, Homer and end with Alexander? <laughs> no, it doesn't, unless you have a sequence where you're doing those you know, uh, in, a, in a different orders. But if it's just a Greek history survey, you actually have a lot of control over that. And I want to point to two, two things is that one of the things that people do, whether it's a Greek history survey or a Rome survey or an intro um, survey like the one I'm doing um, this year, um, this I, most people will think that, oh, how can I bring in diverse voices? Well, I'll add race and ethnicity into my syllabus. And I want to, um, I think it's great. We should all be talking about um, social structures, but you, you know, um, Jackie Murray and I are going to be talking with Katrine and the everyday or animalism people next week or so, I think a couple weeks from now, about how do you bring race and ethnicity in. And if you aren't actually engaging with critical race theory, um, you probably aren't yet equipped <laughs> to have that conversation in your class. Um, so you have to do that legwork before you want to do it. The easiest way to bring um, new voices and new scholars and and um, perspectives of BIPOC people into our classrooms is just to actually look at the scholarship that they're doing. If I'm going to offer readings on Roman religion, I have scholars who happen to not be white who, and I don't represent these as counter narratives. I represent them as the piece of scholarship that I have decided to assign to my students to actually be the scholar. They're, they're not the opposition to the white narrative. They're the, they're the narrative I'm choosing to offer to my students. Um, you know, Lakshmi Ramgopal, Roman historian at Columbia, is doing exceptional work on mobility in the Roman provinces. If you're not teaching the Roman provinces, that's a choice that you've made. But if you decide to integrate the Roman provinces into your discussion of the Rome, into your course thoroughly, there are a lot of BIPOC scholars who are doing wonderful work in these areas. It's not hard to find these scholars and 
you shouldn't be treating them as the voice from the outside that's coming in. You make them the inside because they are inside. They're members of our field. <laughs> they are scholars in our field and these are published works in our field. And just because it isn't the narrative you were raised on doesn't mean it isn't a valid and in fact, perhaps more accurate narrative um, to the one that we were fed on uh, as youngsters. So I, that's the approach that I sort of take is I select one piece of scholarship that isn't antiquity and I decide um, that I'm going to make that scholar be what is what I think some of the most recent cutting edge and, and really uh, engaging scholarship on there. And chances are you're gonna run into, you're gonna choose someone who is not an old white man to do it. Yeah, it's a good point. A drum that I've been banging forever is that Roman provincial archaeology isn't Roman provincial archaeology, it is Roman archaeology. Um, Kara. Um, I, I just want to make a quick point because I think that, and I love this idea that we can't ghettoize these, these scholars, include somebody just to include them. Um, it, it has to be done with um, real attention. But I, I also want to make a point that if we react too strongly and too superficially, you can end up writing a revisionist history instead. And Rebecca, I know th this feminist idea of revisionism is, is really interesting. And, and I'm, I'm going to um, look into that some more because I'm not as familiar with it. But the idea of revisionist history is something I, I push against. Saying simple things like saying, um, I don't know, you guys saw in the media, there were black people in, in Rome. <laughs> right, and then you saw these, you know, pictures of, of um, a family with like a black man and a white woman, and they're holding their mixed race baby or whatever. Or there were female kings of Egypt, you know, like work done. Now, you know, we have equality of the past. This, I, I think, revisionist history. This idea of creating power for people who were exploited and powerless is very problematic. And I'm facing this in my own scholarship right now. And I'll just give you an example of what I mean. So I'm working on harem studies. And within Egyptology, there is recently a pushback against the idea or word harem. And people are saying, well, you can't use that word. It's inappropriate. Um, we call them female spaces. This is something I know is happening in other fields as well. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, what should I name it? Like a female space for the exploitation of one man who happens to be the king for procreative excess. I mean, it, there is no good word. Harem does it immediately. Harem evokes extraordinary exploitation and even abuse. But I think that the women who served in that harem deserve nothing less. And I would like a radical reclaiming of this word. Um, does it exactly evoke what a Turkish Ottoman harem was or a Persian harem or a Chinese harem? No. But if we use, and so some people are like, no, you have to use the ancient Egyptian word. If I use the ancient Egyptian word I'm particularizing, then I have to find the, the Turkish Ottoman word. How can I compare them now? When patriarchal societies all have these, at least uh, hereditary monarchies, all have these harems and we need to reclaim it. It's, to me, it smacks of a, a history textbook in Virginia not using the word slave um, or, or including the word slavery in there. I think these things need to be included. So. There's a, we have to be super careful. We're not trying to make the powerless of the past powerful. We're trying to tell the truth as it was. And if that means, so I try to make my classes and my discussions as much about power as I can. I'm not gonna try to turn this on its head and, and give people on the fringes and margins power they never had. I hope that that makes sense. Can, can I just really quickly respond to, to just explain when you're using the term revisionist history, you're using it as it is used by typically by um, conservative far right groups when they accuse people like myself and Katarina and others who actually do histories of race and ethnicity, histories of gender and sexuality. Um, when I write a book on um, medic women or immigrant women in Athens, that is in fact a revisionist history because what I'm doing is I am excavating ignored past. It's not giving them power. It's actually saying they existed and we sh they are worthy of our study. That's what a, a, a actual revisionist history in its critical sense is and not in the sense that it has been appropriated and, and misused and bandied about in, in media and on the right. So I just wanna, I wanna yeah, push, I, so, so I would just, I mean, having been called in print by scholars a revisionist historian um, as not a bad thing, I think we should recognize that it is in fact not a negative. So I, I, I just wanted yeah, to be careful I, with I, our terminology. That the, the, um, the conservative patriarchy hasn't tried to reclaim this, um, but I think there is a fine line 
to walk there. And as a feminist scholar, I mean, you know, looking at the scholarship of the 60s and 70s, having created this mythological matriarchy of power that we came from, and the amount of scholarship that was created to, to create that, that world doesn't really exist, and one can push it too far. So it, the, the right-wing use of the phrase um, or claim of that phrase excluded, I do still think it's an issue. It's a line to walk. It's a line to walk. Katrin, did you want to have the, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I actually have more practical little kind of cues that for me worked well in the, at the undergrad and the graduate level, which I thought people might find interesting for themselves in terms of bringing in more voices. Um, so what's worked for me in introductory courses is to not use a textbook or to not only use a textbook because I'm sorry, especially when I teach the ancient Mediterranean, up to this day, I am still searching for an acceptable textbook. Uh, the other kind of side to this is to go beyond the uh, publishing establishment and to include pieces that come from public facing scholarship. There is so much there. I mean, there is obviously in the field of uh, classics, uh, Eidolon, and there are blogs, uh, some Twitter thread can be very useful as well. So that, that's been working very well for me. Podcast, um, different short clips, TED Talks or TED vi TED Ed videos. Uh, they have a series on the ancient world that, that, are not, that are not bad and that can be good compliments. So to me, that's been working well. Um, something else I've been doing, which is in line with what Rebecca said earlier, introducing theory or writings from uh, non-white scholars who work in other fields. So um, it can be, I, I've been doing that with ind different indigenous writers. I've named some of them already. Uh, there's obviously Edward Said, Fanon, uh, Spivak, Anne Stoller, her concept of uh, occlusion has been very successful in my upper level undergraduate classrooms. Um, Fabian's um, coevalness, uh, concept also for upper level undergrads and graduate classrooms has been a big success with students. They really, they get it and they engage with it. Um, so that's been successful. And one last thing, which is a practice that I'm still experimenting with and that I owe to um, uh, indigenous methods of pedagogies is the, to disrupt the environment in which you teach. Now we're all disrupted because we're all on on Zoom, but what it's been meaning for me in smaller classroom is instead of having, you know, the chair of authority that's at the front and that talks to everyone, and we have this kind of classical, neo, you know, neoclassical NPP in our format often, um, I've been using the talking circle uh, as it is called by um, many uh, indigenous teachers. And so we all sit in a circle and you can have concentric circles. Now, I'm obviously aware that this doesn't work in all types of classrooms, but what it means is, I mean, you can Google it, but my experience has been that it's also allowed voices in the classroom to actually speak and voices, students who wouldn't speak normally. And it's really changed the classroom dynamic. It's been transformative in my upper level undergrads and in my grad seminars. And now what I wanted to do this year uh, which I guess I might not be able to because of the pandemic, it's to, for my graduate seminar, to start teaching outside. And in Scarborough, we're next to a ravine as well, so I want to try this in my upper level once we have a vaccine. But I encourage you like, to try to think about ways in which the environment in which you teach is itself very colonial, and how just changing the space can change the whole dynamic in the, in the classroom. Well, Nadira? Um, yeah, I, I actually really like all of those suggestions and something that occurred to me and I, I actually is more of a question is, um, has anyone actually, like anyone here, um, used, um, used invited guest lecturers um, to their class? Because I think that would like, you know, it kind of it, what, what gave me that 
thought was um, the, you know, using the YouTube videos. And I, I was like, well, you know, in this, in this environment, we could probably, you know, find videos of, you know, scholars of color that you could share, but you could also invite someone um, that is the expert on, on a subject and have them talk to your class. So, so I actually have spent the last two days and I will be doing this tomorrow and again next week, um, actually doing Zoom interviews and recording conversations with scholars, uh, mostly scholars, actually I think they're all um, uh, non-white scholars or well, various, they identify in various ways, um, but who have expertises in different areas for this class that maybe I'm not, like I'm not an expert in the Bronze Age. You know? <laughs> so I have a conversation with uh, you know, Bronze Age archeologist. I'm not an expert in a Roman Aegyptica. So I have a conversation um, with that scholar. I'm having a, a conversation with an Iranian scholar on um, uh, Central Asia um, uh, in the in, in, uh, sort of in antiquity um, and trade routes and um, religions, uh, because again, I want to incorporate that into my class, but I'm not an expert on this. Um, and I'm having, an, I'm doing an interview. Luckily, the, most of these people are my friends, so they're willing to do this stuff <laughs> for me. Um, but I'm, my friend Lakshmi is gonna be, you know, I'm interviewing her on the mobility in the Roman provinces and in the Roman empire. And so my students will see this as part of the regular um, ongoing um, way that of engaging with scholars and engaging with scholarship and all of these scholars are like sure like here's my Twitter handle they can you know DM me afterwards if they have questions like you know people can be very generous um, I've gone into Katerine's classroom I've gone into lots of classrooms um, I do this for for funsies um, it's 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 actually quite fun to engage with other people students um, I I have invited to campus obviously um, when you can invite people to campus <laughs> But um, when that's not a possibility, um, there are lots of ways that we can bring um, different voices. And especially when we're teaching, we all teach across things that we're, we're stronger in some parts of our courses than we are in others. So where can we bring that expertise that people have? And maybe it's not published yet because maybe they're just out of grad school. Maybe they're still in grad school. Uh, maybe they're just working on this as their magnum opus over 30 years or something. Um, but there are ways to bring those voices into our classroom and get them seeing these scholars and recognizing this as, as the work that we do um, and seeing this as, and valuing it for, for what it is, um, even though it doesn't come in a textbook form. This is a really nice idea, Rebecca. Are you just doing Zoom, basically Zoom calls with, with people that you know and yeah. setting it up like an interview and re yeah. recording and it? Yeah, and I got this idea actually from Elizabeth Manuel who um, contacted me and said, hey, we're reading a chapter from your Immigrant Women book. Would you be willing to talk, talk about it on Zoom for my students last semester when we were all in sort of triage mode? And uh, I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'm happy to talk about, talk about that. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm teaching this class on the ancient Mediterranean world and there's a lot of places that I want to take my students that I'm not necessarily equipped to do it. How can I do that uh, mm -hmm. both ethically and uh, and in a way that is fun and engaging for them. Um, and it's not a lecture. You're not like watching a lecture, but it's actually a conversation that we're having. So there's a dynamic dynamism to it that allows for you to sort of like wake up if you hear a different voice or <laughs> yeah, very cool. Or very cool. Yeah. Kara, do you do a similar thing? Mostly in the grad seminars, but it, just to reiterate how Zoom has blown things up, that you can invite people from across the world to come into your, your classroom. And it's, it's just super eye-opening to be able to, to bring all of these people in and all of these different voices. And I encourage everyone to try to do as much of that as you possibly can. I mean, I will say with undergraduate classes, since they need to be asynchronous, it's really hard to do. And then you have to prep and you have to tape something and podcast it and then put it up. And it's not an easy thing. Um, and there, when it's not live, isn't it funny how hard it becomes when you have to tape it in advance? So um, this is one uh, reason I think having live classes in some ways is so much better. So in a way that, that leads right into the, the final two questions are those sort of easy punty ones, um, but I think could be really helpful to people about what, what our challenges are and what our successes are. So those are definitely some good successes. Um, does anybody else want to throw a success out there with how they've really tried to attempt and have, um, have, have successfully decentered traditional classical pedagogy? But, but I mean, you know, keeping, as everyone has said, this, it, is, it is what we do, right? We, we, we teach the Mediterranean. It's not about saying, oh, I'm bringing in all of these, these marginalized voices. This is part of our, our voice, right? This is part of it. Karen? Yeah, I have a class called Women in Power in the Ancient World, which is essentially that 
typical spin on a Western Civ class, but it's from a feminist perspective. So you're looking at which places, half the class is Egypt because they have more women in power than anywhere else. Don't worry, it's a tragedy in the end and it's all about the patriarchy and they don't really matter. But anyway, half the class is Egypt and then we'll spend a week on Persia, a week on Rome, a week on Greece, a week on India, a week on China. And um, I've forgotten some, Mesopotamia, Levant. We, and we compare all of these to each other. And I bring in, um, obviously, the lens of power. Um, I like to use Michael Mann's um, IEMP rubric, though a white male, super useful for all of the things that we're talking about and exposing a, a patriarchy that we're all working within. And I also use a lot of new materialism, which is essentially blowing up the the idea that humans are somehow unnatural, that we are all a part of this world embedded into this earth, which I think as we talk about everything being exposed, all of our exceptionalisms, American exceptionalism, colonial exceptionalism, I think human exceptionalism is also being exploded before our eyes as we become susceptible to this virus that can take us out at a whim. And so situating humans as a natural part of this earth that must live with it sustainably is a huge part of this class. And yes, it verges on environmental determinism. I heard that phrase, I think, um, Catherine, you may have mentioned it. Um, but this idea that, that people think differently when they're embedded in certain environments and that their cultures are formed differently within an Egyptian environment versus a Greek environment versus, I don't know, a Hawaiian environment is pretty basic stuff. And I think that we need to move into this new materialist framework to um, be able to, to loosen the bonds of this human exceptionalism. So that's this one class that is essentially you know, Gilgamesh to the fall of Rome, but totally not. And through the lens of female power and includes a whole lot of evolutionary biology reading, um, evolutionary psychology, what is male versus female? What are these binaries? Um, lots of different voices that are not your typical um, classical scholarship or Egyptological scholarship. Um, lots of scientific voices. And, um, and yet we're doing you know, the basic, we're touching on all of the, the Western Civ points, but in a completely different way. And that class has been the gift that keeps on giving. It's been really, really fun. Yeah, cool. Um, anybody want to take one minute to talk about a, a challenge and how they've maybe faced a challenge, whether you get pushback and maybe not necessarily from, you know, a, 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 a Twitter troll, but even just somebody within your university or your department, maybe even. So, uh, yeah, so someone asked a question earlier too that I think it goes right into this, which is someone asked the question about how it can be for people who aren't tenured, um, who might be TAs or who might be contingent, who might feel pressure to not um, do these things in their classes or who, who maybe they haven't felt any explicit, had any explicit <laughs> statements made at them, but they might feel um, some pressure to do this. Um, you'll get that pressure. And also I've gotten pushback from students, particularly in my Roman history class from students who took high school Latin and they come into my classroom and they are expecting a triumphalist narrative of Roman conquest. Um, and that's not what they get. And um, they get very angry with me and they write it in my teaching evaluations. Um, so, so um, and they did this before, because I, I, I was a contingent employee, I was a contingent faculty member for six years before I got on the tenure track. And then I know that people think that getting on the tenure track is, is, um, is a ticket, but you're still contingent for anywhere between, you know, you get reviewed at two years, maybe three years, maybe four years, and then you can lose your job at any stage. So I still consider people at that level contingent. Um, so there are actual problems that you will get um, if you present a narrative that people are uncomfortable with or unconfident with. Um, how do you navigate the system? I think one of the ways you navigate the system is that you show how normal the narrative you're presenting actually is. If you bring in um, scholars who are doing really cutting edge work, um, if you bring them into your classroom in any way that you find, whether it's through podcasts, whether it's through readings, whether it is through, um, whether it is through, um, uh, uh, the you know, kind of interviews I'm doing, whatever, if you're bringing in and normalizing um, BIPOC scholars as simply the voices of the field um, and not treating them um, as, they, as if they are marginal um, in the way you present that work to your students, it's really easy for you to actually show, look, look, this is not abnormal. What you were taught is actually abnormal <laughs> or what you were taught is actually outdated and what you were taught is actually um, what you're watching on the History Channel is in fact actually the, the, the bad narrative, <laughs> the political narrative. 
right? So I, I think that um, it, it gets easier to, to do that as, over, as you normalize it within your classroom structures and also as you normalize it with your colleagues. Um, and you're, you know, I've never had, my colleagues don't agree with what I do, but they've, they've at least if I can articulate to them why I'm doing it, um, they, they at least give me a shot. And the administrators that I've worked with are always really um, open to classes that students are interested in. So if students like your classes, they don't really care what your colleagues think um, at the end of the day, if your classes are enrolled and theirs aren't. Um, so, so those are some things to think about, but I, I really do think we do, you will get pushback. You just have to be prepared to articulate it. I was once told by an editor that you should never position yourself um, as a, a voice in the wilderness crying out. You should position yourself as the crest of a, a rising wave. <laughs> and if you position the, the, the new ideas and integrations of the, your program in the, as that crest of a rising wave, um, that it's eventually going to crash over everyone, then it's much more easy to get people to digest it because you're actually inviting them to participate instead of positioning them in opposition. And not that, is, that is a, an absolute high point for us to move to the next phase of this. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I'm going to kick this over now to Vivian, who's been monitoring all of the questions, the Q&A coming in from the audience. And we're going to take the last 30 minutes to deal to, to answer those and have a look at those. So Vivian will present those questions to the panelists. Just sort of went haywire. OK. Um, so there are many Q&A <laughs> questions here, and I just want to say again that if we do not get to all of the questions, you guys, please check on the AIA website. We will have follow-up questions and answers posted there, but I'm going to try and get to as many questions as I can within the 30 minutes we have, or 27 minutes we have left. Um, I'm going to read these exactly as they were typed because I do not want to uh, take over your narrative and decolonize your question. So the first question is, uh, if Black Indigenous people of color are learning what we call Egyptology in other departments and they're successful at it, then why is it necessary to bring them into what you say is a problematic field at its core? Why prioritize what we call Egyptology and bring BIPOC students into it instead of white Egyptologists into African studies? Yeah, totally correct. And that's why at a place like UCLA, I tell my graduate students every day that Egyptology is dead. <laughs> and so I, I don't know how else to say that. It's as radical as you could possibly get. And I try, and I, my students know. So let me tell you just the, the deep, dark underbelly of my own political life. The, my grad students know that when a job in Egyptology comes up in an East Coast super prestigious university, they're probably not going to be on the short list for it because they position themselves in a non-Egyptological way. Now, I, I could be wrong. I hope in some ways that I'm wrong so that one could change it from the inside out. But I see the way things work at, within Egyptology and that UCLA is not considered a bastion of traditional Egyptological thought. That's just not what we are. And that's my colleague, Vilika Vendrick, is working in Ethiopia and considers herself a special, an archaeological specialist of Northeast Africa. And that's, that's how, we're, how we're functioning. So I, I um, write more and more in my scholarship um, that we're specialists of Northeast Africa and use the word Egyptologist less and less. Um, it's a slow move away, but that means the, the field itself um, is changing. I find myself integrating more with scholarship of um, ASOR and ancient history uh, colleagues comparatively more than that, that colonial box of the American Research Center in Egypt. Um, and that's, that's an interesting thing for me to say in this panel that has so many eyes watching, but that's where I find myself going as an Egyptologist, that um, Egyptology as it, as it is, is so problematic that um, to bring, yes, my HBC, the, the Historically Black College pipeline, is that bringing Black students over to a white university to then get, no, it's working in partnership with Howard, who's, who was doing within an African studies department study of this Northeast African place, whatever we want to call it, 
in combination with uh, experts at UCLA who are also doing study in the, this North African place. And we're kind of creating something new. Um, I don't know what that is yet, but I totally take what you're saying as, um, yeah, yeah, there, there are serious issues involved with my privilege of, of bringing people to study my way of looking at ancient Egypt as if it's the right one. So point taken, absolutely. Okay, and that's a good segue into the next question. Um, the UC HBCU collaboration is really great. A shout out to, to what UC Santa Barbara is doing in collaboration with Classics at Howard. This may be a question for the next seminar, however, we're gonna answer it here. What other collaborations are out there beyond Howard and beyond HBCUs to other schools whose students are underrepresented in our archeological fields? Can I, can I, I'll just a quick um, thing. So what, what I'll say is for underrepresented students, either students of color within the United States or Egyptian, the, the, there are little things that we can all do. If we work in the field, when I work in the field in Egypt, I always have an Egyptian partner. And that's something that I do and have done for many years, I think we should all do. Um, as for other ways of getting um, students who don't have privilege into our field, luckily, it, it, well, I have had to change things. I've noticed that I have been accepting students who have a master's in Egyptology and prioritizing those students. That's prioritizing privilege. I now have to accept students who don't have any Egyptian language skills whatsoever and teach the Middle Egyptian from the get-go, accept transfer students, accept students from community colleges. Otherwise, if I keep prioritizing, oh, they don't have what they need to come to my graduate school, I cannot accept them, then I am just going to have the same white faces coming into my field again and again, and that has to change. UC, University of California, does help me with graduate funding for students who are non-traditional students, first generation college students, um, students of color, um, different backgrounds uh, as traditionally represented. And those things, you know, we, we take those things into account. Has it changed significantly at UCLA yet in terms of the grad student population? No. In we have Egyptian students coming in, but there is much work to be done to correct the distrust of white Egyptology vis-a-vis uh, -vis our, our African-American colleagues. Great deal of work yet to be done. So now I'll let my other uh, colleagues speak. Okay, does anyone else have any commentary on that question? Okay, Katherine. Well, it's not, uh, I, I don't have any partnership to suggest, but what Kara said in the question made me think about the very important issues as far as um, uh, archaeology that is within the realm of classics is concerned. And the elephant in the room is language requirements in many departments, including my own. So right now at the U of T, we are 20 faculty in the classics department, half of which are historians. I would say over maybe two thirds of the historians are also in the archaeology stream. The vast majority of the PhD students are with our philology and philosophy colleagues. Why? because of these language requirements. I keep receiving emails every year and my historians and archeologists colleagues is the same from students, uh, a lot from students uh, from outside of Canada, a lot from students who are not white. It would be great, great students in archeology span and we could get them in, but they don't meet the language requirements. And it's a Pandora's box. Our philologist colleagues visibly are uncomfortable to talk about that. Maybe they will watch this recording and feel uncomfortable by what I'm saying, but this is, this is the case. We have to but talk about that. Yeah, language takes years and years and years. It is privilege. It it's is a gatekeeping elitist mechanism to, to keep the whiteness of the field. And there is this hierarchy, right? That philology is above history, which is above archeology. span And this Egyptology and classics, we share this, this problem. And I just, you know, it's funding too. I mean, so we're still stuck in the five-year melon-driven funding, which all of a sudden our students, right? Privilege, privilege. They can't finish because all, all those language requirements. So they trip over it and, and we lose really, I think, amazing students and the fights we have to get in to get that student, you know, oh my God, has no ancient Greek, but a little bit of Latin. And, and you know, oh, they need to go post, post back 
you know, over there and, uh, and then forever be marked as having had that post. It, it's, it's unbelievable. This is really something I think us administrators need to really fight for and say, there's a difference between an Amer American historian, you know, language requirement, whatever, and then an e Egyptologist, you know, North Africa or Byzantine or what have you. Uh, it's, it's much more complex and you, you won't be done in five years. So what we do with those, right? And, uh, and we're losing, we're losing uh, the less privileged. And uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's something I have been wrestling with for years to, to figure out how to, how to put together packages for excellent students who come with, you know, deficiencies. <laughs> Again, you know, the words we use. Within Egyptology, it's funny, within Egypt, you see students coming to American or European PhD programs from the School of Tourism because they do French, they do German, they do all of the colonial languages, the English, that you will need to smoothly move into that program. Then when they return to Egypt, they are denigrated for coming from the School of Tourism <laughs> and not from the traditional archaeology background, right? So the, the gate ways are the complicated and Byzantine, oh, there's a loaded word, but, um, but very problematic. And so, right. yeah. Well, this is actually why I say that uh, I, we acknowledge, we changed our undergraduate major um, about four or five years ago, basically with the understanding that none of our students would ever get into graduate programs again because we decentered the languages um, and privileged the, the history um, and civ track and, uh, and encouraging our students to take courses outside of our department in places like anthropology like the students have to take two of their 10 courses have to be done in another department whether it's religion anthropology um, or, or art history um, and in doing so we basically guarantee that our students who are interested in becoming archaeologists will never get into a program unless they go to a post -boc, uh, and develop their languages or unless they you know we encourage them to do you know, anthropology and classics and geoscience as a gateway into archaeology, but they then have to minor in the languages just to get their foot in the door. And, um, and I have students who did that, and it's a still in um, even have the traditional language track for them. I just also want to add that when it comes then to job prospects, you know, there's this other hierarchy of Ox Oxbridge, right? So we are, you know, oh, someone from UCLA with a PhD will be, you know, when it comes to the job at an elite university on the East Coast, it won't go to us. It, it will be a fluke. Yeah. So, you know, although I think we're better trained. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is, how do you feel about terms like Near East or other terms that might have Western-centered origins? Do they still have relevance despite their foundations? I mean, I'm going to start because I'm chair of the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department at UCLA. So um, it is my great dream, and I am going to bring it up to my faculty um, soon. And I have the support from my colleague, Vilika Vendrich, um, that we should rename our department. And I know that people are going to push back against that, that, that I'm interested in the department being the Department of West Asian and North African Studies. Um, it's, it rolls off the tongue just as much as Near Eastern languages and cultures, doesn't it? So it, 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 but it takes all of the politics out of it. And why would we not do that? It's a simple thing to do. And it reconfigures who and what we are in a very useful way. So I'm, I'm on board, but um, I know I'm, my colleagues, maybe in 2020, 2020, it'll be okay, but I don't know. Let's see, but I've said it here, so maybe it'll make it easier. <laughs> Can I jump in even though I'm not a panelist? Yes, um, please. I just spent the, I just spent all of yesterday um, reworking and, and it started from you, Kara, from a conversation we had a few weeks ago. Um, my students in, I just teach an intro class called Ancient Cities, intro to archaeology, you know, so it starts in Mesopotamia and it ends in Rome. And, I, and every year they say, but I don't really get what the Near East is. And that's actually quite a telling question, isn't it? For somebody who, these are 95% science students who don't understand any of this until they get out of my class. They're really interested in the class, um, so they tell me, but they don't understand what this Near East thing, and I spent all of yesterday changing Near East to Western Asia because West Asia 
is a thing that you don't have to explain, right? And I just well, like, I kind of do because they, they're like, wait, where? What's East Asia? What's West Asia? I mean, but the term Middle East is so loaded with all of the Islamic right. Right. Um, dialogue that we've had, so you can't call it Middle East either. That's as problematic as anything else. So we're going to re. So in the same way that the words idiot and retarded used to be part of scientific. Of verbalizations of, of particular ways of the human mind's working, we have to discard them, and it's it's just a rolling. You know, soon West Asia will probably be out too, but I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what we do with it. <laughs> Can I just suggest an activity that seems most probably very simple to everyone here and everyone who's listening, but that's been really successful every time? You just show a non-Eurocentric map of the world to the students. So you move it upside down, whatever. Then you see the conversation that comes up and then you ask them, what is in the middle of the map of the world you're used to? And most of the time, even grad students, they have never thought about this. And then it can lead to an interesting conversation about the Eurocentrism of classics, which is another name that we should, we should explode or like abandon. And it, it also leads to interesting conversation about why are we calling this near, it's, it's near what? It's far what, right? Yeah. So I find that using these maps has been very helpful, both in my undergraduate and graduate classroom to think about these issues. I mean, classics is such a code because what are you gonna call it? Ancient European studies? And then- that's, Yeah, that's the question, yeah. right? White studies, then it's white studies. <laughs> Okay, there's another question. Do classicists, archeologists, academics have any power to pressure universities or government bodies to make any kind of reparations for a colonization? Any ways to give back to native indigenous colonized communities? I, 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 my Can mic's off. Work, yeah, it's part of the work we have to do every day, every single day. We have to know what our privilege is and every single, so for that question, when somebody's like, why do you have the black student come to the white place? I mean, in a sense, it is, it is my privilege that, that, that that's the power dynamic. So that's where the, the invitation must come from me because I'm the one with the funding access. I'm the one with the, with the, foundation um, to, to be the infrastructure to invite those students. I'm, I'm the one going into Egypt with the almighty dollar that's, that's worth so much more than the Egyptian pound. I need to take that responsibility seriously and, and do what I can to write grants with my Egyptian colleagues. I, ju I just won a, a, a grant with a colleague from the American Research Center in Egypt from USAID funding. And we're going to be working in, at Karnak Temple. And the, the grant, writing, grant writing is a game too, right? We all know how complicated and difficult it is. And an Egyptian that doesn't know how to write a grant for USAID, God help us all, is he sends me this stuff and I'm like, oh, this is gonna have to be redone. It's not because he doesn't have a good brain, it's because he wasn't trained in this b ridiculous game of grant writing and I have been. So I can rework that grant with him and then boom, we both win and move on. But if I don't do that work with him and for him, it's not going to work if I don't allow students of color to come in and have seven or eight or nine years to finish a PhD rather than five, it's not going to work. So we have to make allowances and, and change things from the center of power and be open about where the power is and, and try to distribute and, and give from, from that. So yes. Does anyone else have any commentary on that or should we move on to the next question? All right, Katerine, then Sorolta. Yeah, briefly. Um, do I have the, the power to, you know, talk to the president of UFT? So he talks to Justin Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, to ask him to repay and give back the money to indigenous people in Canada. I mean, realistically, between you and me, I don't think so, right? But what power do I actually have beyond what has become the standard in Canada acknowledgement of, of, of the land we're on? I have, I have a power to bring in these conversations in my classroom. I have the power to educate my graduate and undergraduate students into these issues and weave it into what I do as an ancient historian or archaeologist. And I know it might sound like an unsatisfactory answer, but I maybe naively believe that the more people do that at a small case, there's a ripple effect. 
whether these students end up in the field or not. This is part of what we can do. So let's just do it. What was, what's, what said this before in the last thing that it's, it's not a mistake that it's all women in this panel as the white men have abandoned it because there's no power here. Indeed, and all, all those wonderful things you, you two said, and it's collaboration, I think, the collaboration, the power we have to collaborate with people within our universities and outside and create that wave of change and just never, ever give up. Okay. Um, the next question is, I serve in a Hispanic serving institution. Has anyone thought about decolonization or whatever term you want to use in terms of Spanish speaking or even English speaking students from a variety of Spanish and native cultures? Could you discuss some specific approaches that I might consider? I teach Roman and Greek history mostly. Anyone, Does anyone have any commentary for this topic? University of California has a his oh big bug oh scary has a historically um, uh, I don't know if we use the word Hispanic or Latino now in that I think it's probably Latino um, I particularly say Latinx just to be Latinx, politically yeah. correct but mm -hmm. there is such a funding body and I am speaking with colleagues in um, Hebrew Bible uh, in particular for for that I mean I mean it's I, I, we, one could do it for Egyptology as well, I suppose, but there's not as much um, political identity politics interest and there is more um, with the Latinx community and the Hebrew Bible community. And again, the same, the same language requirements and, and blockades in the path, all of these obstacles are going to come into play as well. So there needs to be more help given to enter the field. We, College of Staten Island just became a Hispanic serving uh, institution. This the term that is being used, uh, okay. has to do with the percentage of enrolled Latinx population. And uh, it helps you in, apparently this is the big deal, to get grants. So this is again the vehicle of change, is to collaborate, get grants, and then change things. So in terms of our sil you know, syllabi or, curric or our curriculum, it hasn't changed, right? It's still the old curriculum. Uh, that is uh, kind of 1950s, sort of, kind of, maybe, almost. Anyway, so um, so hopefully, you know, with being that, not just grabbing it as because we can get external funds, but also grabbing it as a sense of how can we change from within to be, you know, within our times to, to educate, <laughs> to educate the, the next generation here with and give them the right tools. And, uh, but right now, from where I'm sitting, it's simply uh, right now has to do with money and, uh, and it hasn't even moved into this other uh, kind of the other steps of what we have discussed here. So, so for me, I'm the takeaway is as a dean to start working on that. Okay, this next question I think is for Beth and I. Curious as to why there are no scholars from the Mediterranean on the panel. Um, Beth, do you want to take it first, or should I? Um, clarification on the question, um, like uh, scholars who live now in the Mediterranean? I, or, I'm not really sure what, um, if one means um, why there are no scholars who originate, who you know are scholars in the Mediterranean, scholars, not scholars of the Mediterranean, if you see what I mean. Um, this focus, what we wanted to do with this is focus on um, North American academia, which I think has its own particular kind of skew in the way we um, do things. Obviously, there are parallels with other places, but we wanted this to be of the most use to North American um, academia right now. Um, so that's one thing, like my comment earlier about Roman archaeology, uh, provincial archaeology, being Roman archaeology, anyone from Europe who's listening to this is like, yeah, duh, no kidding. Um, but in <laughs> North America, that, that's, that's not been true with provincial archaeology for a very long time. Um, so I, if that's the question, um, then, then that's why. Um, I think that must have been. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure how to read this question. I sort of off the cuff took it as why aren't there any 
scholars whose focus is the Mediterranean. Um, and I'll take the heat We're all, we because all do that. I, well, I predominantly put this uh, panel together and so I'll take the heat for this if someone doesn't like the panel that's put together. But I thought in, in, in my, you know, recommendations of who should be on the panel that we had a really great eclectic mix of archaeologists, historians, um, art historians, and such that, um, I mean, even, okay, let me finish, please. Also, you know, <laughs> now you interrupted. Um, we had a good group of scholars who represent various fields that intermingle with archaeology. A lot of what we all do kind of, uh, you know, multidisciplinary encroaches upon these various different areas. And, you know, although Rebecca Kennedy, Catherine Blouet, uh, Kat Cara Cooney, they don't call themselves archaeologists, however they are, um, I've read their works. I know they're, they, they do archaeology work. Nadhira um, is a PhD candidate at University of Michigan, and she is very much also an archaeologist. Beth Green, very much also an archaeologist. And um, all of us do our work on the Mediterranean or around the Mediterranean, if you have a map and know exactly, you know, where these areas are facilitated. I happen to do work east and west of the Mediterranean. Uh, so I'm not really sure how to take this question. I hope I've answered it. And I apologize if someone's unhappy with the panel. If you have recommendations of who you would like to see on the panel, please feel free to submit that information to us and we can work on it for the next series. Carrie, you wanted to add something on to this? That this I, it's interesting the way this, um, what is going on in North America in terms of Black Lives Matter and the, the racial inequities that are being revealed to our eyes is infecting our scholarship in what I think is a good way, but then also with filtering back to the places in which we study. And those places could be Egypt or Greece or Italy, North Africa, Mesopotamia, Syria, Jordan, wherever. And it's interesting then when you see the perception of what is going on in America, in Egypt, for example, where they say, well, this is not our problem. We don't need to worry about this. This is your American racist problem. And indeed, this racism is everywhere. And within Egypt, you see uh, the colonialism having infected the centers of power so much that Nubian Egyptians are excluded or that an idea of what it means to be Egyptian as an Arab is very problematic. And all of these discussions are happening about what it, what it means to have, what identity politics are invading everything and um, where the power actually is. So if I, if I, I have put on social media discussions of African-Americans being excluded from Egyptology, and I've gotten a number of responses from Egyptians who are saying, well, this is not a part of our politics and you need to keep this out. And then other Egyptians saying, no, it is absolutely a part of our politics and this is their colonial baggage and we need to have this in. So the discussion, it, it blows up everywhere. And it's, there, it's something I think that we can be uh, more receptive to than not, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a very um, hot discussion. <laughs> Catherine? Yeah, um, to me, th this question points to a, a broader issue that's beyond this panel, but that pertains to our discussion, I think, which is the hegemonic force of attraction and hegemonic spotlight of um, European, mostly um, British and North American Anglophone scholarship in all of antiquity fields. Uh, let's face it, Oxbridge and American scholars in our field and in other fields are colonizing a lot of the academic world outside of continental Europe where you still have very national kind of markets. Um, and so what I've, what I've been noticing is uh, over the past few years, there's been a lot of conversation around the topics we've been discussing today um, in North America and in the UK. And we still have a lot of work to do to in, truly involve and engage with the voices of our um, colleagues from the global majority. That is not only BIPOC or BAME scholars, I know these are problematic expressions, from 
North America and Europe, but also from the global South. Um, this is still something we are not, I believe, doing enough. And we need to kind of make more of an effort to balance things out. Okay. Um, so I think we're out of time. I don't know if we want to try another question. Well, or... I think I'm going to be mindful of everyone's time um, and, and just end with my remarks. So I did look through a bunch of the questions um, when I had a minute there. And a lot of them, just for everyone um, to know, will be in fact focused, um, they, they will be answered, I think, in the next two panels. So if you're able to do the next two panels, why don't I just put my plug for those in here? Those were gonna be at the end. But next week on August 19th, we have from noon to 1.30, we have teaching race and material culture in the ancient Mediterranean. So obviously a, a follow on from this discussion, but then a couple of questions particularly about museum and cultural heritage were in there. Um, August 27th from 3.30 to 5, we have Becoming Better Accomplices, Justice, Activism, and Reflexivity in Teaching Museums and Cultural Heritage. And that'll answer a lot of those questions about museums um, and, and teaching museum and cultural studies. Um, those you can register for in the same place as you did for this one. So just go right back to that AIA website. You'll also be getting, I'm sure, information after this one and, and you can follow those links as well. Um, so really, all I want to do here is thank everyone. I thank our panelists for being here and for taking this time um, when everyone I know is scrambling to get ready for the semester and in fact change our syllabi. Oh, there was also a question about um, how do we do all of this in the context of online asynchronous teaching. That is in itself a huge giant question. The AA also has, I think, like every other national society, a sort of COVID-19 panel. Uh, our committee that is trying to put together um, various resources. So keep an eye out um, for what they're up to as well. So I just want to thank our panelists so, so much for taking your time in August here in our, our traditional research and teaching prep time. And thank you to everyone who joined us here. So to all of the audience members and especially those who put in questions and help this conversation going, because we're really interested in hearing what you're interested in. Um, we put those questions together you know, based on conversations, but really want to know what you guys are most interested in. So to that end, we will try to answer these questions um, that, that we didn't have time for and, and again, go to the future seminars. Keep an eye on the AA website where we will have in the next few weeks and months, really, um, we're going to add a whole section to the website that is about social responsibility and all, in all sorts of ways, um, not just about, you know, race and racism and the conversations that are happening now, but many different things. Um, so keep an eye on the AA website for that. Um, you've got the next two seminars and then there's also the annual meeting which will be fully online in January and I'm sure some of these conversations will be uh, you know carrying on there as well so thank you so much to everyone we'll end the seminar now sorry we went four minutes over um, but I think this was a rich conversation and it will continue in the next few weeks as well so thank you very much to everybody <laughs>